Hello, hello, hello! It is 3 p.m. on Saturday, and I am Gail Carriger, and this is Alive, which I have not had an opportunity to test the technology on, which I usually try to do before I start, because Facebook kept crashing on me. <laughs> However, I can see a few people watching, so hopefully it's working. Uh, today, we are talking about this book, maybe? If you guys have some questions or not, I'm happy to talk about anything at all, as usual. I'm sorry it's a bit dark. Hello, Charity, how are you? Um, yes, hi, Katie. <laughs> sorry it's dark. I, uh, I'm having some issues <laughs> with power, uh, and stuff. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's strangely dark here in California this afternoon because it's really overcast today, but also um, my office is struggling, shall we say. Um, but it's too noisy at home, so I have to do it here. Anyway, uh, today, thank you, Lavender. Yes, happy book release. This is the book. It just came out. Uh, it's finally available in print. This is, this is the print edition, but this is the arc with this slash thing here. I actually haven't seen the actual print edition yet. I've only seen this version, which, as you can see, uh, I did some fixes to. Those are my <laughs> correction post-it notes. Um, but it should look somewhat like this, <laughs> I hope. There's some interesting stuff going on with the printing industry right now, but there should be a print edition available. It just might take a little while to ship. Uh, so yeah, I'm super happy about the formatting for the print edition. Uh, I did a, I did it myself and I worked really, really hard on it. So um, I hope you guys, those of you who, who like a print edition are happy with this one. Um, what was I gonna say? What else was I gonna say about it? Yeah, then that's it for now. Um, so yeah, those of you who uh, ordered a print edition, it should come within the next couple of weeks, I hope. Uh, who knows what the presses are doing. It's the actual physical printing presses that are delayed right now. There aren't that many of them, and so when there's a backlog or a delay, kind of, it just, worldwide things get clogged up in the book industry. I know it seems kind of big, but it's actually a really small industry. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me okay and stuff. Let me know where you're calling in from or tuning in from. Tuning in from sounds so old-fashioned now. Oh well, I'm kind of an old-fashioned person. I have some show and tell for you today, which I am very excited about. Um, so, and I promised some friends that I would tell you things. So I'm telling you things while you come up with questions for me. How's that for a deal? Uh, here's the things I have to show you. The first one came from my darling friend John, um, John Picaccio, who is an artist in the um, sci-fi fantasy world. He's very well known. Here he is. John. Yay, John! He's also one of the nicest human beings on the planet. Um, he has been making these uh, awesome, like, Dia de los Muertos influenced, um, uh, masks and so they're kind of like a sleeve that you put on and then you can pull it up and you can turn the bottom of your face Into this thing. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? Anyway, he um, he sent me one because I was so excited about them and They're called La Tierra masks and that is uh, there it is or La Terria uh, They're based off of a card series that he did. He's an amazing artist. Anyway um, I'm very excited about that. That came in the mail uh, So I'm looking forward to wearing it uh, I'm not wearing it right now because I didn't want it to mess up my lipstick. You know how I am. Uh, and then the other thing that came in the mail is also very exciting, and it is this. It is a beautiful box, I have to say. Um, so I have to tell you guys about David. David um, Slayton and I have known each other since the very, very beginning. He is one of you in that he discovered my book super early on. He discovered he read Solus and fell in love with it. He's also an author, and so for the past decade, basically, we've kind of kept in touch and became quite good friends as a result of him showing up to my events every time I was in Colorado. And, um, you know, we've slowly graduated to meeting each other's significant others and um, having dinner and stuff like that. And now he is about to be an actual published author, and I am so happy for him and they he's sending out these the most beautiful boxes and I'm very excited about it um but uh, 
<laughs> um, so he's written this book. It's called White Trash Warlock, and it's like um, it keeps getting compared to my San Andreas stuff. So if you like the San, San Andreas books in particular, you'll probably like this book. Here it is. It's got an awesome cover, and um, yeah, he's he's just the most awesome, sweetest guy. He's an amazing author, and it's urban fantasy, and I am so excited for him. So that was all. Um, it's just really, I guess, it's just really fun for me to see one of you kind of grow up and become a, an author too, in a way. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so happy for him. It, it, yeah, anyway, uh, that was it. I just wanted to share those, those two things. Um, darling friends of mine doing amazing stuff. Uh, makes me happy. And then the last thing I have to share with you is a spontaneous thing because I stopped at a bakery <laughs> on the way over to the office today and I picked up one of these. So this is my show and tell food edition. Um, right, I'm going to pick it up and get my fingers sticky. But um, I don't know if you all know about this, but and I am going to mispronounce it because it's a French pastry. It's called a financier or a financier, depending on how you want, whether you want to pronounce the ending R or not. Um, and it is, uh, it is a traditional dessert made from almond flour, kind of like a macaron is made from almond flour. But as you can see, it gets um, kind of caramelized. You do it in a brown butter, like a popover. And um, it's just... They're so delicious, and they're normally sort of gluten-free by nature, kind of like a macaron is. Uh, and they're just one of my favorite desserts. They're really hard to find in my part of the world, and they're totally delicious, and I highly recommend them. They look kind of innocent. They're, traditionally, they are in this kind of golden brick sort of shape, um, and that's how they got their name, because they look kind of like a gold brick, so financial, financier, and I think they were also like served in, in to bankers or something in coffee houses or whatever. I'm not sure on the complete history of the dessert, but I highly recommend them if you ever get a chance to try one. Um, they just have a delicious flavor. They're kind of like the almond version of a madeleine, if you've ever had a madeleine cookie. Uh... Anyway, oh, and Charity is talking about White Trust Warlock. For those of you who are uh, curious about it, it's coming out within a couple of days, and it is um, urban fantasy mixed with paranormal romance, and it is, it is a gay protagonist written by a gay protagonist. Um, yeah, and I'm written by a gay protagonist. Yes, David is the protagonist of his own life. <laughs> Sorry, David. Anyway, um, it's great. Uh, it's charming and fun and sexy and adorable. And it keeps getting compared to me. So there it is. Yay. Uh, right. Uh, there. So we've had our show and tell for today. <laughs> me telling you about the things that are making me excited and happy right now. Um, so yeah, I didn't really have anything else prepared, but I'm hoping... Um, I'm hoping you guys have questions for me and we can just get, oh, <laughs> there's it. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Here's hoping we're not really protagonists in our own life because considering what most authors put their protagonists through, I really don't want to go through that myself. I suppose it depends on who's writing me. I think it'd be fine if I'm writing me. But most other authors, I'd just be like, please don't, because uh, <laughs> I'm just going to get in, <laughs> get in to get in a lot of trouble. So I'm not drinking tea today because I had coffee already. Um, I know I drink coffee sometimes, but it makes me a little bit hyper, uh, so I don't really need any more caffeine in my life. Um, David says he's making t-shirts. That's, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it is a beautiful cover. It reminds me a little bit of the TJ Klune cover for, um, The House on the Cerulean Sea. I like that sort of, um, I think it's a Jasper Ford influenced original, uh, the, the, that kind of quirky house thing. I think originally it comes from his books, you know, 15 years ago, whenever those ones first came out. Ah, uh, right. Um, questions? Does anyone have questions for me? Questions about the heroine's journey? Questions about life? Has somebody asked me a question already? I gotta scroll back. Do, 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 do. Ah, there's a question.
question from Emma. Right, Emma, fantastic, well done. Also, Emma is illustrating how best to ask a question, which is to put the question mark at the beginning of the sentence. That way I know it's a question and then I can read it. Emma says, how am I preparing for NaNoWriMo? Will the fact that a lot of authors are participating help my competitive side? <laughs> oh, Emma has paid attention to my lives before. Um, and that the rooting for me and the YL Techno Fantasy. Okay, so um, how am I preparing for NaNoWriMo? Uh, so I talked about this a little bit in the last Chirrup, but um, I got kind of road blocked, not writer's block, but just because I'm pantsing the book I'm currently writing, which I never do, I got kind of bogged down in the middle. So the, and I am not writing a fresh project for NaNoWriMo. So for those who don't know, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month, and it is customary the, customarily the month of November, which for me is usually a terrible month to do NaNoWriMo. Um, not necessarily because of Thanksgiving, although that of course does throw me off since Thanksgiving is a really big, really big deal in my family. It's like the biggest holiday. Um, but because I used to have a book release at the beginning of November, almost always, all of the finishing school books came out at the beginning of the November and most of the San Andreas Shifter books. And so, uh, I would be on book tour for the beginning of my career. So I've just, ever since I found out about NaNoWriMo, I've never been able to participate in it. And the traditional rules of NaNoWriMo are, um, that you start a fresh book for the month of November and you're supposed to do 50,000 words, I think. This, this girl has not looked up the rules. <laughs> So, sorry. Um, I, so I just, I've never, uh, I've never done it. And there are like forums that you can join and, you know, hashtags that you can follow and all sorts of tips and tricks and, and author mentors and stuff for, to help anybody who wants to participate in writing, try attempting to write a novel during this month. This month, for many of us in lockdown or quarantine or what have you, um, at least for me, is ideal because I'm not traveling for the first November in a really long time. I'm not even going to my family for Thanksgiving. So I'm going to do NaNo. I've never done it before and I'm going to do it this year. However, I'm not going to write something fresh. So that techno fantasy that I've kind of been writing, it got bogged down because I needed to go back and change a couple of things and tinker with the world building a bit. Um, and so what I'm doing is, to prepare is I'm rereading. So I've written about 50,000 words on that book already. So I'm going back and rereading the first half, basically, doing the world building fixes that I wanted to do, changing a couple of characters and a couple of other elements. So that's kind of what I'm doing to prepare. To prepare. And then during that process, I'm also coming up with sort of the outline for the, the, for the rest of the book. Um, yeah, so that's that's my preparation, and then so my goal for Nano was just to finish the book, which should be about forty to fifty thousand words during the month. Um, so I, I should be attempting to do the right word count, although I won't push it if I finish the book in under that, then it's done. Um, and for those who don't know about this weird techno fantasy that I've been talking about, it's been I've been talking about it on the chair, but that's about it because I'm not sure. I'm still not sure what I'm going to do with it, whether it's good enough, whether it's qual, I, like I just don't know. Um, but since I have not been really inspired to write anything for a long time, the fact that this thing wanted to be written kind of is why I'm working on it. So thank you for your question, Emma. I'm gonna scroll back again to the beginning to see if I had any initial questions. It looks like it's mostly just people saying hi and where they're tuning in from. Oh, there's one. Uh, Emma asks again, uh, Vixen Ecology out for Christmas. Um, well, it's not. Vixen Ecology is a short story that I've written in the San Andreas universe that's a pickup short story, so it's interstitial. You will need to have read the San Andreas books. I mean, you can read it, but it won't make sense without having read the San Andreas books. It's about Mana and Lovejoy because I kind of couldn't deal with them in the Enforcer Enigma. I didn't have the bandwidth or the word count, but they needed, they needed a little short story, so I wrote one for them. Um, uh, it's not a Christmas story or it's, or a holiday story really at all, so I probably won't release it like with that umbrella, you know. Um, but I am gonna try and get it to you before the end of the year, if not at the very beginning of next year, uh, just because I can and you know I want something. I want to give something to you for the holidays, I guess. Um, 
end the year with some th sort of positivity. Uh, Jameson asked if I will put a link to the masks in the group. Absolutely. And I'll also probably, I will put a link in the live uh, description when I'm done. That's this mask that, that John sent me that I'm very excited about. Um, whoop, it's upside down. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll put links to everything, including, um, including David's White Trash Warlock book. Um, don't worry about that. Julia's late. Julia, oh, sorry, Julia, um, uh, do we get the print version from our indies? Um, you should be able to. It, according to Ingram, it's listed, but, um, and I've, I think I've sold some through Ingram. Ingram is a distributor for print books, incidentally. Uh, you can go, I know this is a pain, Julia, but you can go to the press kit page of my website and that has the ISBN. And if the indie bookstore is claiming they can't get it, they can get it with the ISBN. Like they should be able to. Otherwise they don't deal with Ingram. Um, in which, or they're not dealing with Ingram anymore or something. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's really hard to distribute print books. They don't make it easy on anybody. Um, these days especially. Uh, but yes, you should be able to get it from an indie bookstore. That Most indies have in carry Ingram books already, which means they order from them, which means they should be able to order mine. But bah. Bah is what I say it. Lavender, yes, I'll put a link to everything in the feed. Um, sorry, I can't do it right now because I do these on a mobile device and a a a a k a my dumb phone, my dumb old phone, and I'm just not adept enough at linking because I, uh, <laughs> there's a whole conversation, sorry, it just distracted me with its amusingness. Um, do, 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 I'm reading through the feed looking for uh, other questions. I, I, Ian, <laughs> Ian asks if I will be doing any more online events like Confluence. Uh, the Feel the Love panel was fantastic. Wasn't it great? That was my favorite panel. I basically left. So Confluence last weekend had an online uh, convention basically and I did panels for most of the afternoon on Friday and I did three panels on Saturday as well and the last panel for me was only at seven o'clock at night but it was at ten o'clock for most people. Um, and it was a late night panel about sex and sexy times and writing sex in books and it was so much fun. Um, I actually left that panel kind of revved up and excited about online conventions, which I haven't been for a while. Um, so yeah, I'm totally open to doing more online conventions. I had such a good time at that one. Uh, and I have Coastal Magic coming up. I just listed it on my website and it'll be out. I will put the announcement in the uh, cheer up. Coastal Magic is a convention run normally out of Florida. I've never managed to make it but always wanted to and so it's gone virtual this year. It's in February of 2021 but I listed it and the dates and everything. So that's my next online event I think if I don't get asked to do anything else soon. Um, but yes, I love, I, I, I really had so much fun at Confluence that I'm, <laughs> Ty is accusing me of cheating. Um, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Uh, Doc asks Christmas decorations, bright, uh, tasteful or bright and gaudy, cause why not? <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, Lord Akeldama school of thought. Um, I like the lights a lot. Um, I love Christmas lights. I always have. I tend to like my personally when I do them I like to do like the twinkly white yellowy lights. I just you know I mean look at my decoration aesthetic right. I, I tend to like kind of spa simplicity when I decorate for lack of a better term. Um, so that's, that's, but I do love looking at the lights. I think the lights are so pretty. Um, so that's where I fall on Christmas decorations, um, or holiday decorations, if you will. Uh, Jan asks, what is the heroine's journey? To which my answer is, 
it's complicated so I wrote a book about it um, but if you want the basics I have a blog post um, it's a recent blog post that I did just you know Gail Carriger heroine's journey uh, which is basically the introductory I posted the introductory chapter to this book which also I'm not coy I basically lay out the heroine's journey in the introductory chapter I wrote a book because it requires a lot of explanation as to the history of it why it's disenfranchised how it works the beats break down and you know uh, what kind of tropes and algorithms and how to identify it and some popular um, media that uses it like you know famous movies and stuff so that's why I needed to write a whole book but I did break down the basics of it in you know it's publicly available so you can go check it out uh, basically it is a it is the way that we study the hero's journey and how that pattern um, guides narrative there's a heroine's journey which is a, a different um, and it also has a pattern and it also guides narrative um, and so I thought everybody knew this and it turns out uh, in my experience at conventions that most people don't study it the way I did and so finally I was like we need a book about it and uh, no one else wrote it so I did so that, that's the heroine's journey for you uh, it's nonfiction I know I know uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> and in the chat people are talking about um, <laughs> their cats which I support um, David has dropped the ISBN for this little puppy so um, the first ISBN number uh, the one that ends in 40 is the one that is for the print edition so um, if you just copy that little number and you know, give it to bookstores they should be able to order it or order it for you do, 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 do. Uh, cheating on Nano. Yes, I'm cheating on Nano. I think the point of Nano is to try and get as many words on the page as consistently as possible. I think the point of Nano is Nano Rimo is to see if you can write that much, if you can finish something. And I think the point of Nano is to prove to yourself that you can do it. Like many professional writers, I probably don't need Nano because I know I can do it. I've done it 30 times. But um, but I like, uh, I don't know, I'm a real communal writer. I like writing in a community. As Emma pointed out earlier, I'm like a competitive writer. I like to write with other writers. I like to sit across from writers in coffee houses and write. And I just haven't had that, you know, for eight months. So I'm very much looking forward to sort of the experience of NaNoWriMo for the first time um, kind of virtually as an effort to make myself accountable. Um, so for those who are kind of joining this conversation a little bit later, that's because I'm doing a podcast with Dan called the um, Everyday Novelist Podcast. And those are every and day are separate words, but um, and basically he puts together a group of us who are all writers at different stages in our careers and we're all doing nano and we get together and we talk each day or as frequently as we can about how it went each day so um, and so you'll be able to listen to me every day if you want to or, or most every day talking about um, the current project that I'm working on and how it's going as part of this nano ramo podcast so that's that's why one of the reasons I'm doing it this this year was because Dan invited me to be part of this podcast and I'm excited. It's going to be interesting. Emma says reading the heroine's journey was like finding a part of my identity I didn't know and it explained so much. Thank you. Um, I, I very much appreciate that. Um, is there another nonfiction topic that I feel really passionate about that I think lacks a good approachable resource. Oh gosh. Um, yes, thank you, Emma, for reposting. Um, if if I don't get your question, please do ask it more than once because I, I sometimes miss it. The the way to process questions isn't great. Um, is there another nonfiction topic? Not that I've really encountered yet. I mean, like, I get obsessive about really obscure tiny things to do with my previous career, like ceramics. Um, but I don't, this is a strange thing to say, but I don't expect people to know about those things. So I don't feel compelled to write a book about like Tano pacification in 8th century Islamic 
industrial complexes, right? Like, oh, uh, it's okay if you don't know about that, uh, frankly. Uh, but the heroine's journey, I just thought, like, it just frustrated me to see so many of my fellow writers, but also like critics and people who analyze pop culture for a living and journalists and stuff, just not knowing that this alternative model existed. Um, so both, you know, the consumers and the and the and the producers and I was and I'm so frustrated by the hero's journey to be fair like it's just not something I've ever really identified strongly with and so um to see it talked about all the time and the heroine's journey just neglected chronically was was what drove me to write the write nonfiction. and that was an extreme form of frustration <laughs> um I don't know that I experienced that in other um in any other arena uh, something tangential to do with maybe sort of like traveling and traveling as a as a single female might be part might be something like that but I've never like I've never desperately hunted for a resource the way I did for the heroine's journey like for this I wrote this book because no one else did um, I was just so frustrated that I didn't have a ready resource to recommend to other writers or to recommend at conventions, you know, um, science fiction and fantasy conventions or romance conventions because commercial genre or even mystery, because commercial genre is what pulls from the heroine's journey the most. So, um, like I just didn't have that resource. And uh, I mean, there are books out there on the heroine's journey. M Maureen Murdoch is out there, um, but she has a young Jungian psychological analysis approach. Um, you know, there are a couple others that at least sort of tangentially talk about it or mention it. Um, so, yeah, so far, no. Um, and like I, uh, to be frank, it's very hard to write nonfiction. It's much more time consuming because I can't just, you know, wave my hand in the air and make it up. <laughs> you know, there's no like new rule of how the universe works that I get to make up when I'm doing nonfiction. <laughs> not me anyway. That's not how I approach facts. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I have to, you have to stop and constantly research and look things up and find resources and stuff. So, um, yeah, so I don't know that I will do it again, uh, because it was, it was hard to do, <laughs> to be fair. Um, uh, but I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I never rule anything out. You never know. I might be moved again. Um, and Anna is asking the same question about whether I have any nonfiction ideas in the works. Um, Anna asks if I have considered writing a world bible behind the scenes look uh, at the parasol verse. I have a world bible. It's a wikia and you can google Gail Carriger wikia or parasol verse wikia or parasol protectorate wikia and it will come up. It's basically, ba a wikia is the same chassis as Wikipedia. Um, mine is open crowdsourced because I rely on y'all to uh, help me <laughs> with it on the regular. Um, and that is also what I use myself. So there are sometimes spoilers in the wikia because I need to keep it updated even if I'm currently writing something. So apologies, but that's how I work now. Um, it's an online resource essentially, and it is linked like world elements and characters and all that sort of thing. And you know, appearances in books. Um, yeah, I can't keep track of it all myself now because you know me I like to have ca old characters show up in new books and you know and I know you and if I like get someone's eye color wrong or something I'll be in big trouble <laughs> so I uh, gotta keep track of everything so yeah I call out pretty regularly on social media for your help because um, it's a lot to keep track of now um, yeah complicated stuff uh, Shannon says what writing references would I recommend new writers check out aside from the heroine's journey? Um, you mean like just in general for new new authors like like um, Strunk and White or or um, Writers Inc or something like that? Um, I can't pull any. I mean, there's a for the heroine's journey. There's citations and references at the back, like a pretty elaborate list. I the references, which are things that I talk about in passing, like like movies and stuff like that. I actually have annotated, um, and I and I'm trying to be funny uh, with the annotations. And then the <clears throat> citations are the things I actually you know quote from directly and pull in the text. So that there that's in the book. Um, <clears throat> 
In terms of just new writers getting started, I have a resources section on my website. Uh, it's one of the tabs at the top. It has a drop down and there's a whole section for beginning writers. And it includes, um, you know, blog posts that I've done with podcast recommendations. If you want to listen to resources on the craft and the business side of being an author, uh, there's a couple of my own blog posts that I've done on that. I don't write about it very often. Um, I don't know that I, I think there might be a nonfiction book list as well. I don't know that I necessarily have many that I would recommend. I, I'm, I'm kind of out of touch with the current genre of nonfiction on writing craft. Uh, uh, I haven't been wild about a lot of the craft books that I've read and uh, maybe that's my own approach to being a writer. I just, uh, I just <clears throat> one of the one of the things I did when I was writing this was try to write kind of not teaching you how to write in terms of like sit down every day and do this because I feel like how we write is really different depending on what kind of author you are and who you are as a person and your own personality. Instead I tried to provide like a beats model as in here's the pulses of these different narratives and you can use them as a chassis for the plot and pacing of your own book. Um, but how you approach that and how you actually put the words on the page is gonna be something that you you learn for yourself, I think. Um, and it changes. Like I, every time I write a book, I sit down and I think, well, this will go this way. And of course, every time it's different. You know, like I've been saying, the one I've worked on right now is I'm, I'm writing it without a really strict outline, which, is maybe the first time I've ever done that, at least since I turned into a professional author. Um, so, you know, like the process of writing, I feel like is different for a lot of different people. And so writing a craft book is very hard. Um, the business end of things, I do think there are a lot of good resources. I tend to find they're coming out of the podcast realm and the blogosphere more than actual printed books on the subject. And I think that's because uh, the business side of being an author is changing so quickly. It, it's really hard for the industry, the, the books about the business to keep up with the pace at which business keeps changing. Um, so yeah, so uh, that was a very long answer to your question, which is basically um, check out the resources page on my website because that will, that's probably got the best advice um, that I, that I have currently have access to. Shay asks, Will I do a live heroine's journey breakdown um, and that they really want the Hunger Danes like I did for, oh, I'm sorry, Shay, I can't see the rest of your question. Facebook won't show it to me. Stupid Facebook. Um, so I break down two uh, movies slash book series as heroine's journey in this. Um, the Harry Potter first book and series and then the Twilight first book and series um, and I chose those two because they were so commercially successful and because they were turned into movies as well as books so I figured they would I would reach the biggest audience of people who knew what I was talking about if I talked about those two pop culture examples so that's why I chose them um, there I'm not showing any kind of favoritism or anti-favoritism or anything. I chose them for purely practical reasons. Um, and Shay is saying that they would like me to do that with the Hunger Games. Um, <laughs> it's like, have, like, throw a franchise at Gail and have her break it down as a heroine's journey model. Um, I would struggle with the hair, with uh, Hunger Games because I haven't read it. <laughs> um, and I've watched the movies, but only once. Um, so I'd have to rewatch if I ever did that. It might be kind of fun to do like watch alongs or something where where you know where I say in the in the newsletter or something, okay everybody, we're all gonna watch this thing and then we're gonna talk about it. We're, gonna, we're all gonna watch Crazy Witch Asians and then we're gonna decide if it's a heroine's journey or not. Um that would be really fun, but uh, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about it too much. Um Francesca asks as I was reading The Heroine's Journey, I kept thinking of different movies and shows and realizing, oh, that's The hero Heroine's Journey, and I can't read the rest of the comment. <laughs> Francesca, if you'd like to ask your question as a shorter sentence, that would be great. Um, I can no longer click to see more on the comments. It's not letting me for some reason. Um, 
if you want something yes that is my mother's favorite saying is um if you want something done properly darling then you have to do it yourself or at least it's one of her favorite sayings uh Yvette asks what I enjoyed writing about this book um and I have to say it was going back to primary sources so um many of you know this but in case you didn't uh, my uh primary education is in archaeology but I've all but my focus as an undergraduate was also on classical archaeology, which meant I um, studied a lot of um, ancient Mediterranean cultures and um, linguistically and mythologically as well as archaeologically, because archaeology in the States at least is an, is an interdisciplinary major when you're an undergraduate. So you have to take courses at all these different departments, which is one of the reasons I loved it as a degree, because I got to like trot over to the science department and take some chemistry or some geology, and then I got to trot over to the, you know, philosophy department or the myth or the classical department, right? That was why I had so much fun with it. Um, but I hadn't gone back and like read Nagy's translation of the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, and I hadn't gone back and read the Anonymous since I was an undergraduate. I just sort of kept referencing them and then I would go and check a bit of it if I needed it but I didn't like didn't I hadn't reread it from any of those from start to finish or um Budge's um Resurrection of Osiris those so those are the three I pull from for for this book I pull from Inanna or Ishtar um Isis the Egyptian goddess um Inanna and Ishtar are the Assyrian goddess basically and uh, Demeter from you know the ancient Greek goddess slash Roman uh, so I hadn't like reread those thoroughly and I also hadn't looked into kind of the sourcing of them from an archaeological perspective in a really long time and it was really interesting to go back and kind of reread not just the myths themselves but also like how they were put together particularly in Anna and Ishtar which was this like insane bits of the cuneiform tablets um, had been scattered all over the place. It's not cuneiform. I'm sorry I forget the um, correct word but so bits of these stone tablets that chron that chronicled this myth were like all over the world and so you know they had to be pulled back together again by this team in the like 1930s or something to to put this myth together to figure out what it was so it was really fun reading about that that I think that was my favorite part um, about writing the book was going going back to the primary sources I always love me a primary source it's one of the reasons I like writing the Victorian era so much uh, the primary sources are so ridiculous Robin asks, what was my reaction to the most recent technical challenge on the Great British Baking Show? <laughs> so, I'm sorry if this spoils uh, Great British Bake Off for anybody, uh, but are you talking about the Rainbow Bagel? Because I was screaming it's an LGBTQ thing at the, at the screen, if that's what you're asking about. Um, the Great British Baking Show had the had the rainbow bagel on recently, and I was like, it's a queer thing. Like, don't circumvent this. But apparently they were attempting to, the, the Brits were attempting to claim it as their own, which was just ridiculous. Anyway, uh, it's an amusing episode if you want to watch that. Um, Shannon, I'm sorry, I don't, <laughs> I've drifted and I don't know what your question is pertaining to. Um, but I think you're asking about, like, technical advice on structure and POV. Um, and as a general rule, I tend to go to podcasts these days, um, or blogs. Those, those would be best, but, but try my website as well. Sorry guys, that was a non sequitur. Um, Charity is exclaiming about found family, but I don't think that's a question. Ooh, Yvette asks, what's my favorite recipe for Thanksgiving? What a... <laughs> What a challenging question. Um, so my uh, mother, uh, my darling and beloved mama, uh, embraced Thanksgiving as I like to say only a Jewish expat from the UK could embrace Thanksgiving. It is her favorite thing in the world and mostly I think because uh, it is a holiday that is only food uh, and she equates food with love and that is all she cares about <laughs> and uh this is why i'm a glutton um i love food so much because of i i think uh, food is love um anyway uh, so she does a roast up at thanksgiving that is very british-ish <laughs> i have to say shall we say so um we do a roast turkey and roasted potatoes not mashed 
Um, and then, you know, roasted Brussels sprouts and, uh, you know, all the, all the rest of it. Uh, my favorite thing is the gravy. Um, I love gravy. I would drink gravy. I will spread cold gravy on toast. Yes, yes I will. Uh, gravy is the best thing ever. Um, yeah, and it is a traditional brown gravy of the of the UK style, I would say. So it is a gravy that is made with a roux and, and uh, the fat from the turkey and then, sorry for any vegetarians out there, uh, and then broth. Um, my mom does hers uh, so she does her turkey stuff with lemon and thyme and garlic, and so the gravy is very kind of garlicky. I like a little bit of lemon in my gravy. I like an acid component in almost all of my cooking, so um, I will always swoop in uh, when my mom is doing the gravy. And because she is British, and I have inherited this from her, gravy has a little bit of Marmite in it. Just, just a little bit, a bit of Marmite. Mm -hmm. Makes it just that much better. A little tang, a little salt. Oh, so good. Anyway, yeah, so gravy for this one. <laughs> it's like, if you could just slather in gravy, I'm happy. Uh, the other recipe that's my favorite is my mom's uh, stuffing recipe. Um, again, apologies. Uh, this is the point where I say uh, my mother and I, very bad Jews, because the stuffing recipe is mostly sausage and bacon. Um... <laughs> and it is great. It's kind of like a sausage, bacon, and a lot of vegetable meatloafy thing. Um, so uh, it's, um, you know, it, you do like a mirepoix, and then um, my mom puts a little corn in it because as a nod to the, to the new world, so to speak. Um, and, then, uh, and then it's like a bunch of sausage and bacon, crispy bacon, and then um, she sort of shows it some breadcrumbs in a loose approximation. She kind of waggles breadcrumbs over it. And then uh, egg as a binder. Um, and it's amazing. I will just make stuffing and gravy occasionally for dinner. Um, yeah, it's a, it, is, it is the way to make stuffing the star instead of the corner dish, instead of the afterthought. Um, so yeah, that would be the thing I would say is my favorite thing. And then the other thing that always happens at my family's Thanksgiving is chutney is on the table as well as um, cranberry sauce. So I betrayed my British roots by falling in love with cranberry jelly in particular, the one that comes in a can and has the rings on it, except no substitutes. Uh, but my mom will not leave chutney. Um, so we always have bowls of both chutney and cranberry on the table. So that is, that is our Thanksgiving. Uh, Lavender asks if I do anything special for spooky season, um, aside from eat a lot a lot of candy <laughs> more than I should probably no I used to dress up because I love dressing up um, but I haven't really in a while it used to be that there was often a convention on or around excuse me um, Halloween so that's that's what I do it is one of my favorite holidays I have to say um, but I, I don't really celebrate it anymore sadly I'm too old but I do love dressing up if I get the chance. <laughs> Jameson asks, how much whipped cream is too much on pumpkin pie? I'm gonna shock you all. Um, first of all, did you know there's a way to stabilize whipped cream? This is the most exciting thing I've ever discovered in my life. You use, um, there's a recipe out there, search for it. I can't remember the proportions off the top of my head, but basically you use shelf stable powdered milk and you can stabilize whipped cream so that it, it doesn't go watery if you like leave it overnight and stuff. Very exciting. Um, but actually I prefer custard. Uh, <laughs> Again, you have to remember, um, I was raised by a very British mother, uh, and I would go to England quite a bit, so, um, the, the Brits put custard on everything, loose custard, um, you know, which is like poured custard, like bird's custard, um, and it's actually really good on pumpkin pie. <laughs> and I prefer custard to, um, to regular whipped cream. I like whipped cream too, but I prefer custard. Uh, put an egg in it! Francesca asks, can I give us, can I give you some more examples? I forgot what we were talking about, Francesca, I'm sorry. Uh, this is what happens with the comments, is I get distracted by a, a comment. 
Oh, Ty is asking about The Legend of Korra. I think The Legend of Korra is probably ultimately a heroine's journey, but I need to rewatch it, and I just can't face, uh, what is it, season two or season three, so I haven't rewatched it. Uh, but they, it does end up together as a partnership, so I, I'm thinking heroines, but I, again, uh, ah, need to rewatch. <laughs> Doc is making a very funny joke. Uh, do do do. Blood gravy. No, I've not had blood gravy. I wouldn't rule it out. I'm interested in these sorts of things, but I haven't had it. Um, Lavender asks, with my love of food, do I have any tips on eating a decent, uh, on keeping a decent figure? Uh, currently, it is uh, develop weird food allergies while you're in lockdown and then stop eating for a while. Um, no, don't worry, I'm fine. Um, so my again my mother my mother's coming up a lot in this live i hope she's not watching she'll be embarrassed uh everything in moderation including moderation <laughs> is uh, one of her sayings which is um i love food but i don't eat a lot of it that's my thing um so you know i can have it but i can't have the whole of it whatever it is and i just have pretty good willpower basically um i don't know where it comes from i also have a not very big stomach so i can't eat that much uh, gluttony is my sin. Uh, I have eaten, overeaten so much that I've had to throw up uh, twice in my life. I'm that bad. So uh, <laughs> I have learned to um, just not eat a lot, uh, which means that I both love and hate a buffet because I do want to try every single thing, uh, but I never feel like I can eat enough to get my money's worth. <laughs> but I will try every single thing. Um, it also makes me very adventurous um, ordering because I will look at a menu and see the thing I've never eaten before and that's the thing I'll order. And then if I don't like it, uh, which frankly very rarely happens since I, I like, I, I have really weird and wide ranging taste. Um, but if I don't like it and I don't eat it, I'm not particularly fussed because I'm probably full after like four bites anyway. Um, yeah, that, that would be my biggest tip. And then, um, you know, most of the time when I'm not like traveling or eating out, I am kind of an eat food, like real food, mostly plants person, um, which I know is a, is kind of pat, but, um, I was raised mostly vegetarian. Um, and you know, I genuinely love vegetables. So I eat a lot of vegetables and I love them. Um, so mostly vegetables and lean proteins and stuff when I'm not, when I'm cooking for myself. Um, but yeah, the, that's my biggest tip is just, I don't, I don't eat very much, but I am pretty curvy, <laughs> pretty curvy person. Uh, Robin asked if I've made cranberry chutney. I think my mother would probably keel over from the shock if I recommended such a thing. She is the chutney maker in the family. Uh, she makes a green tomato and apple chutney traditionally and it is amazing. It is a loose chutney. It's not very sticky. Uh, it's kind of runny uh, and it's just oh, it's so good. And the whole house always smells like chutney, but she's very guarded with her recipe and she's never taught it to me. Uh, so I don't know yet. Um, it is on my agenda at some point to go out and make chutney with her so I learn how she does it so that I will have the chutney, the sacred chutney recipe. But, um, but I've never, so, um, my, uh, my stepfather is from Jamaica, and so she does do a spicy scotch bonnet version with, like, spicy chili peppers in it of chutney, so she has modified, <laughs> but they've been together for, like, 20 years, so it took her a while. So, you know, like, if I wanted her to put cranberries in, I would have to, like, I would have, it, it might take 20 years <laughs> for her to do it. <laughs> Um, but it might be good. Uh, the, the spicy chutney is really good. I, I like really spicy food, so, um, I love it. Love it. Um, Samantha asks, where do I get my clothing ideas and what are my favorite colors? Um, well, I'm very inter interested by, by vintage and retro fashion looks, uh, mostly because it's the shape of clothing that fits me best, the aforementioned curvy fig figure. Um, uh, so yeah, I look at, uh, I, you know, I follow a lot of like old vintage fashion feeds and stuff on, online and on, on, in the blogosphere. What are my favorite colors? 
Um, I, I've become much more egalitarian in what I will wear. Uh, I still don't like to wear yellow. I think I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of have a yellowish skin tone and so I, I don't think yellow, yellow looks good on me and I don't think kind of like fall autumnal colors look great on me. Um, but, and I would say my favorite, I like, I wear a lot of red because I like red and I wear a lot of black because it's easy to pair with. But I would say that my favorite color to wear is like emerald green or greens in general. Uh, I love greens and like it's just not a color you see people wearing all that often. So um, green is probably one of my favorite colors to wear. Um, that is different from what I like just aesthetically, which is different from what I like in cover art which is different from what I like to live in so I have a lot of I'm, I'm a bit of an aestheticist so I have a lot of thoughts on colors but um yeah Robin asks what my favorite vegetable is that is maybe one of the hardest questions I've ever been asked <laughs> um my goodness I love them I love vegetables um probably well the tomato is more of a fruit so is an avocado so they don't really count, right? Um, I feel like the tomato is so versatile and I like acidic flavors a lot. Um, I like bright flavors a lot, so I'm very attracted to tomatoes. I think, oh God, there's so many good vegetables out there. I have come around in my old age to the leafy green, um, like chard in particular. So like rainbow chard or Swiss chard, it's like a magic food, I think. It just like, you could put it into stews and it would just sort of disappear and become one with the stew. Um, and then, you know, you can do something different with the stems and with the greens. And it is unbelievably good for you, chard. It is one of those that you look up its nutritional value and it is insane. It's just like full of minerals and vitamins and oh, it's so good for you. And I really genuinely like it. Like Swiss chard with just a little garlic butter or something. Oh, so good. I'm one of those that will like go to a steakhouse or what have you and then like tunnel into what's going on with the leafy green sides. Like, do we have a cream spinach? Uh, that's what gets me interested and excited. Um, yeah, so that's one of my favorites. Um, you know, there's some like great, interesting, vegetables like that I feel like we in the United States haven't really had enough to do with and I'm thinking about like lotus root which is so good and I feel like why do we not have more lotus root <laughs> in our lives um that kind of thing so yeah I love ugh, I love vegetables I love them Shannon asks if I've tried Filipino food before. Yes, um, I love it. It is, a lot of things are fried in Filipino food. And I should have, I should have said this when people were asking me about like dietary restrictions and like, I'm not against anything. Let's be very clear, like fried, whatever. But I do kind of naturally avoid fried food and I avoid drinking sugar. Those are like kind of two of my standby rules. Um, so if it's liquid, I don't want it to have any sugar in it. Um, and I, I don't eat fried stuff very often. I certainly don't f ever fry anything for myself. Um, so there was a great like hole in the wall Filipino place near my um, apartment when we first moved in that was like kind of cafeteria style. Um, and I tried a bunch of kind of the like stewed home style Filipino cooking. Um, there, but I don't remember what anything was called because it was totally one of those places where you just walked in and pointed and it's me So I was like that looks interesting. I'll put that in my mouth, which is probably how I'm gonna die But also my life philosophy um, And but they didn't have labels on anything <laughs> or anything um, So that was great. Unfortunately, it closed down But um, so I have tried quite a bit, but I can't name any of the dishes because I basically was just like I'll eat the thing <laughs> Um I always joke that the reason I travel is so I can eat. <laughs> that's it. That's I just want to eat everything. Um, I can't. No, I'm sorry. I can't share my mom's green tomato chutney recipe. Someday I will. Uh, unlike her, I'm not a believer in keeping good recipes to yourself. I think you should share the love. But someday I will be able to share it. Um, so it's getting on towards the end of the hour. Um, this has been fun, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming by. Um, but if you could stop asking questions, uh, that would be great. Um, a, a vegetable covered in gravy, maybe? Yes. Um, a vegetable covered in gravy would be great. Anne asks, would I write a cooking book? Um, like for tied in with the parasol verse. Yeah, I think that would be really fun. 
Um, but there are some wonderful Victorian cookbooks out there already. Uh, so I don't know that I necessarily need to contribute. I would love, you know, one of my careers that I didn't have that I would have loved so much would have been historical food um, or something to do with historical food or even ancient cuisine. So when I was doing Latin, I did the Apicus, which is one of the Latin cook cookbooks when I was doing like Latin translations and stuff. Um, and I did like a bunch of ancient um, Roman recipes, um, which required cooking, like cooking, which required growing like lovage because it's not something you just have around, lying around anymore. You can't go to a farmer's market and get lovage, at least not here anyway. So you have to grow lovage because a lot of Roman cuisine uh, requires lovage. It's something I really loved to do as an archeologist and still like to do. I did a whole Victorian sit down meal once. I cooked out of a Victorian cookbook. And that's because um, I feel like taste is something that we actually have access to immediately experiencing from ancient and historical time periods. You can actually try to recreate recipes. And that is a great way to experience this one aspect. We don't know exactly what it smelled like in ancient Rome. And um, we don't know exactly what it looked like. We have a pretty good idea, but we don't know exactly. But there is a way we can almost exactly approximate what it, approximately taste what some of the food tasted like. The fascinating thing to me about Roman cuisine is how African it tastes. Um, so it tastes more like kind of Egyptian food or even Sumerian food. It's very earthy. It's full of cumin and lovage, which is a kind of celery-ish flavor profile. And that's of course because like a lot of things we associate with Italian cuisine did not come in until new the discovery of the new world. So like everything that's tomato based, um, all the polenta, right? Like all the rice dishes, most of the pasta, like those things did not exist in Roman times. And so it's a completely different cuisine. The other interesting thing about Roman cities is um, it's an eat out cuisine. So most uh, residents of an urban environment like Pompeii, for example, didn't have kitchens themselves. They, you, you just ate out all the time. And, um, and so the cuisine is shifted for laymen in particular and for, you know, um, middle class and lower class people in Roman cities, the cuisine was shifted to what we would think of as takeaway style food. So easily portable food mostly. And then you had these amazing, you know, feasts that the elites and the patricians were doing, but it's, it's still, it's, it's, um, and like, you sort of intellectually know this, but I didn't really know what the flavor profile was like and what it was, what was actually like until I um, actually cooked some of these dishes and ate them. There's a great blogger called Taverna Mediterranea, who is an, or an expat or an Italian. I'm not quite sure what, because she does half her blog posts in Italian. But anyway, um, who all her blog is, is recreating ancient Roman food. Um, this happened, you know, after I was doing my research on the subject, but totally fascinating to me, this, that kind of thing. So that's, that's what I love to, one of the things I love to do that I don't get a chance. I don't know how we got on that subject, <laughs> but always happy to talk about, oh, fried zucchini flowers, Yvette, like, oh, mwah, oh, they're so good. I love fried zucchini flowers. Yes. I'm so, how could I forget fried zucchini flowers? But there's so many good vegetables. Um, Puerto Rican food. Yes. Um, I have had some Puerto Rican food, but not very much. It is a cuisine I would like to explore a great deal more of. Um, what's my favorite curry? My favorite curry is Thai green curry, no question there. I love a lot of curries, don't get me wrong, but I am a girl who likes cilantro, um, and a, like I've said before, I like bright acidic flavors and I like super spicy food. So Thai green curries are one of my favorites. I like this Thai sour curries as well a lot. Uh, but green curry is probably my favorite one. That's the one I usually gravitate towards when I'm trying a new restaurant. Moving along. All right, well, I think we're probably closing out on uh, what has been uh, food times with Gail. Yay, food! Um, <laughs> this has been awesome. Uh, yeah, I'll remember to drop those links in the group and also um, 
and also in the description of this video once it posts and uh, in for the YouTube folks it'll be in the comments below links to all the things I talked about at the beginning uh, which was the um, awesome um, uh, like the awesome masks from John and um, David's new book, which I'm very excited about. Look at it, it's pretty, it's so pretty. Um, oh, and my book, which is out now and in print, yay. Um, if you cannot get it from your local indie, it is up on Amazon as well. So I hate to recommend Amazon, but there it is. Um, thank you all for showing up and asking me questions about food, my favorite topic. I'm gonna go eat my, um, my little financier, yeah. and um, I will talk to you all next month. I don't know what we're gonna talk about, but it will be fun. Well, it's it's NaNoWriMo, so maybe we'll be talking about that. All right, bye-bye.